The most important area of the instrument is, is an area that we're talking about that is, let's say, incorrectable. There are other areas of the instrument that are correctable. So, talking about the ones that are incorrectable first, those are the tops and backs and the sides and the foundation of the instrument that you glue together and it's done. It's now a box and a body, a resonant body. That you, you can't easily undo. Although you can still work it from the outside and make some correction to it before you put a finish on it and so forth. The things that are correctable are the external parts, let's say the bridge, the tailpiece, uh, and those kinds of things. And, and that, that's a very fascinating area unto itself. But backing up a bit now, if we look just at the top uh, as a vibration uh, or vibrating diaphragm, um, the, there is no one particular aspect that is more important than the next. You can screw it up at any one place so that you have to have everything lined up just right. If we start from the production of sound, it all starts with the string. You're vibrating the string and setting it into a motion. That motion, that information is collected at the bridge. So you have to think. I, I try to think the mechanical process from the top down, from the string, where it makes contact in the pocket of the saddle, the saddle itself, now to the string posts or the bridge posts, uh, and on down to the base of the bridge. Now from the base of the bridge on out and to the top, you're, you're, always, kind of, you're always moving sound in a direction. It's, you're moving it through and still retaining the information as wholly as you possibly can. You, you don't want to lose any of this information. So you're trying to capture it all the way. And that's why things have to be as efficient as possible. Every design aspect of the bridge top, the, the bridge base, and on down, moving from top to bottom, out onto the top of the instrument where it pulls out, the sound starts to move out, and you're moving it in directions. Naturally, we all know the sound is going to move 10 to 1 faster in the up and down direction. So it's going to move faster from this end to that end. Okay, going across, it's 10 times less. That's the general ratio. That's why we put tone bars in these things, to try and move sound sideways in a faster condition and try to catch up with the 10 to 1 ratio. And Hopefully we could even it out 10 to 10 in a perfect situation. We never get there, but we try. So in moving sound out from the bridge, assuming we have a, a really optimized design of bridge, now the problem is to capture that information and move it into these areas of the soundboard. As we're doing that, we have dimension, physical dimension of the wood. Well, everyone by now has a pretty good idea of what dimensions are for all these things. There's so many plans, there's books, there's videos, there's all this information that's out there. Cut this to 4.5 millimeters and you cut that to 2.8 and so forth. It'll get you there. It'll put you into something of... Uh, of what, uh, what we have, uh, we call it an expected kind of sound. We're making a guitar, it, you cut it this way, it'll come out sounding like a guitar. You cut this one like a mandolin, according to the directions, it'll come out sounding like a mandolin. That's fine and good, but what happens, what can happen from that point forward becomes more special. It can become more special because now you can bring out uh, the individuality of the piece. You can bring out the real potential of the piece and now make them, make them special. You can make them happen. By altering some of these dimensions, uh, according to experience, I can't sit down and prescribe to you, no, you should cut this one really at 3.8 millimeters and then you should taper over to uh, uh, 2.9. That just can't happen. It can't happen without having the experience of knowing what those dimensions mean to you and to the wood at hand. Uh, because one spruce may be a lot harder 
than another one. Another one might be soft, more compliant. Um, you have all these varying conditions of the wood. So dimension is going to change somewhat, maybe not terribly consistent. It's one reason why I look at plans uh, and drawings with dimensions and they don't mean a whole lot to me because it's only that one instrument. If you made all instruments like that, they wouldn't have the consistency that you might think you have. So, um, one area near the edge, we were talking about the recurve on the outer portion of the soundboard. Is that more important than the rest of the soundboard? No. It's as important as the rest of the soundboard. Uh, and at that portion of the soundboard is where you have the ability to flex the top uh, I think of it as the low end of the instrument having that compliance the ability to move the top uh, where low frequencies can operate more efficiently I, I've, I've taken somewhat of an approach to uh, this information idea of capturing information at the saddle and the bridge and moving it through the instrument. Uh, I, I've, I've been trying to take it down into a, a, a new, another path where I could make the, uh, the opposing ends of the dynamic spectrum more dynamic. Uh, and how to do that is to really start playing with um, the tone bar layout of the top, and, and that's another area too. Pretty interesting stuff. When I look at a piece of wood, I, I see the finished piece there, and I can imagine all the material that doesn't belong there. Well, how to get it off as quickly as possible has always been, you know, the task at hand. And one of the ways to do that is to pantograph it off. And I, I don't object to doing that. I, I also pantograph, um, the rough stuff off and I leave myself with um, uh, plenty of room for hand carving. Uh, I just need to get the rough stuff out of the way. Now I'm in the ballpark where I can start to play with it. Uh, an interesting thing that happens when you do pantograph, if you're, if you're consistently pantographing, what you will notice is when you start to tap these pieces that you just, let's say if you did a run of 10 pieces and you tap on them, you're going to find they're cut all the same way, but they all tap differently. That's an interesting observation, which tells you clearly that no two pieces of wood are the same. So you're going to have to deal with them as no two pieces are the same. <laughs> That's the way you have to approach it. Um, what I find a problem with in pantographing is